Rising of the Lark, I think is the most glorious tune. When the Welsh Guards were formed in 1915, this was the regimental march that was chosen for the Welsh Guards. Um, in fact, I was reading this book, which is the, the, the romance of regimental marches, when I was researching the, the album. And I was sort of reading these accounts of, of Welsh, newly enrolled Welsh Guardsmen singing old Welsh airs as they marched to Paddington Station. I just thought that was an amazing image. Um, and it's a great tune, so I, I put it on the record uh, in, in the world's best key, E major. There you go. And what drove the choice of material on, on the album? So I was asked by Ian Brown of Island Records. Incidentally, he was the fella who um, signed Bellowhead to Island Records. Um, and he heard me talking on Radio 4 in 2017 about Made in the Great War, the final tour of that. Uh, and he rang me up and said he was in, in tears, listening to this story in his living room, he was in tears and he rang me and said, do you want to make an album of music to commemorate the end of the, end of the First World War, um, you know, and an album of, of music that might have been played on your unfinished violin had it, had it been completed? And I sort of thought about it for a while and thought, crikey, a whole album of, of First World War music, you know, that, that could end up being a big, sort of, slightly odd, jingoistic, strange statement and you know actually I did I said give me a week and I did a load of research and ended up finding a load of beautiful melodies and the first thing I did was try and find some links between the traditional music and you know the folk music that I play and the period yeah. uh, and so the first the first person I looked at was George Butterworth um, who collected lo loads and loads and loads of folk songs um, and obviously arranged them and did amazing orchestral arrangements of these things uh, so I, I delved into the full English archive, looked at what George Butterworth collected and found this, this tune called The Highland Soldier. Two tunes actually to the same song, The Highland Soldier, and I went into my spare room and I just played everything that's on that track, track one on the album, The Highland Soldier, was just what came out immediately of my brain and I just demoed the whole thing uh, in about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and so I did, that was the first thing I did and then I delved into the regimental marches of the British Army. I don't know, five or six tracks on the record of our regimental marches. And so I went and I was listening to the Coldstream Guards recordings of all these tunes, uh, you know, full brass band arrangements, just trying to, again, see through all of that stuff and find the best tunes uh, and which ones were actually the most beautiful melodies, the ones that I could do something with. Yeah. So there was the regimental marches of the British Army. Then, then I sort of looked into the the pipe majors, the Scottish pipe majors, and the tunes that they'd written. Fantastic book called The Pipes of War, um, which contains all these tunes of of uh, that were written in the trenches by these pipers. You know, and I, you know, there's some very famous ones like the Battle of the Somme, which is played all over the place, and that's on the record. I think that's the most beautiful melody. But there were some others, three others on the record, which may or may not have been played since they were written. Wow. Um, you know, there's this great tune written by this guy, Ian McPherson. It's called Sad Am I, and it's just the most beautiful tune. And in the Pipes of War, it's written as a reel. You know, so it should be like... But I was just sort of playing this tune slowly to learn it. And it turns out it's incredibly beautiful, slow. And then, again, I sort of went into a spare room and just demoed it out um, so yeah and then finally I guess the other thing was I wanted to find some stuff that wasn't British right. um, and that was incredibly difficult uh, I bought a huge quantity of, <laughs> of CDs of, of Belgian and French and German and you know all these other European countries their their music of that period and it's really difficult because a lot of the European countries march to operatic ex excerpts and stuff so there was nothing I could do yeah um, but there well, was because of the way it was going to be performed well you know I mean there's no we're very lucky I suppose here because a lot of our old country dance tunes are regimental march tunes and were relevant to the time whereas I couldn't really take a piece of Wagner and and do anything with it sort right. of thing whereas actually looking into into German stuff I, I, I found this funny little old, really old, um, traditional, as far as I can find, march tune, um, and turned it into a fiddle tune uh, and stuck it on there, coupled with a British a British uh, regimental march tune called Be Gone Del Care. Um, 
And the other thing on there, the other German thing is actually, it's a, fun a funeral tune still used today, but it turns out it's actually a Swiss traditional waltz. Um, so it was hard to find stuff that wasn't British, but I did, I managed it. Yeah. But there wasn't a huge amount of stuff I could actually make anything with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. So um, you said in the press around this that you never really thought about doing a solo album. Mm. Why is that? Uh, I, <laughs> this may sound odd, I, I don't know, but, um, you know, I've played in other people's bands since I was 18. Mm. You know, I sort of left school and then joined Bellahead and then played with John and then with Faye and I was playing with Hannah James and, and all these other lineups and, and Liza and the full English and Leverett and all of those things are continuing to change my playing in my style yeah. and it's not that you have to arrive at a finished article any musician who stops changing and developing is sort of lost it haven't they but I just don't feel like I'm cooked yet <laughs> uh, and I just you know why would I make a solo record because I don't know what I sound like yet and I have no idea what what that would be um, so it took someone to suggest an idea for one yeah yeah if I, if I were to make a solo record with no sort of brief, mm. I have no idea what it would be. Well, uh, even now, having, having made one? Well, I, I, I mean, I am starting to think about it now, what, what, what a second one might, might be. But it's interesting because, you know, we recorded the Unfinished Violin February, March 2018. And so it's, it's been released a month ago, whatever. And even now, I would play that differently to how I played it in February, you know. So my playing is, is changing constantly and, and so on. So it's it's hard to know what, what a solo album of mine would, would sound like even now. I don't so, think people who do solo records like see it as necessarily the definitive no. statement of their playing. It's how they are at that particular time. Yeah, and any album is a, is a snapshot yeah. for sure. Um, I think the 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 joy I get out of playing music is from playing with other people and bouncing off other people and communicating with other people through music, you know. Right. Um, and it's hard to do that on your own. Having said that, you know, the whole album, the whole of the unfinished violin, because of my sort of touring schedule last year, was it went from being being nothing to being a fully demoed sixteen track, fully demoed in my spare room thing in six days. Mm. And so when I set my mind to it, it all just came out really fast. And, and yeah. all the ideas were sort of, and I was so excited every morning. I'd get up at about 4.30, 5 o'clock every morning. I'd go into the spare room and just demo new new ideas. Yeah. Um, so it was very exciting. I just, um, I guess, I just love collaborating with people. That's, mm. that's what I love. So yeah. who knows, maybe I'll do another one. This, this album really represented, for me, a new a new start it's like actually what am i going to do without people like rob or andy or john or eliza or whatever what am i going to do on my own so it was really exciting to be able to do it yeah although some of those people do play on me they do uh what was what was kind of cool about this record is that it was all demoed before i sent it to any of them to listen to right so yes there are other writing credits on the album but everything, everything bar Jack Rutter's chords on the guitar, I had largely dictated or scored or whatever. You know, of course, there's bits of artistic freedom within that, but I feel total ownership over this record. Yeah. So when you, when you say you, when you went about demoing it, yeah. um, did, you, did you record all the instruments yourself? Or? Yeah, <laughs> which, which went, fine to a certain extent I mean I'm a concertina owner I certainly wouldn't say I'm a concertina player um, but I can I can find the odd chord here and there and I again I can't play the cello but I did some cello parts some bass parts fiddle viola um, and so on uh, I even played a bit of guitar on some of the demos as well but um, but yeah I mean I can't play the piano at all so all the piano came from Becky Price's head and she's she's a genius um, but yeah, it was 
that was it was a wonderful experience to do it because like it was just me bouncing off myself and then I just went round to Becky's house with my little portable recorder and stuck it on top of her piano and said here's a tune what do you reckon and she just <laughs> cool came home whacked it into you know my computer and then there was a demo there so it was really it was so fast it, everything was very very rapid it wasn't sort of considered over a year and then you know so it's very much a, an, an immediate album that came out pretty quick. In terms of turning the, the record from a set of demos to a finished mm. record that we can now buy, mm. how did that happen? So I demoed it last October and we then had a John Bowden and the Remnant Kings tour in the November and I took the demos with me and sat down in the back lounge of the tour bus outside the, the lead mill in Sheffield, I remember it very well because the tour bus had broken down. Uh, and I played the demos to Andy Bell, long-standing friend and amazing engineer and producer, uh, and just said, look, I've written this stuff. What do you think? And it was great. And he, you know, we sat down and he listened to it and said, oh, you could do this and we could get horns on here and a string section on here. And, um, so we did that. And then it was really a matter of scoring out some things for a string section uh, and a, Sam Fisher, who's a flugelhorn and cornet and trumpet player. Uh, and then we went to uh, a studio in Northumberland, um, Ian Stevenson's studio, uh, and we did most of my fiddle parts solo, just on my own to start with. I mean, going in to record this, this stuff was, was weird because I've never sat down in a recording studio on my own and started a record off on my own. So that was a very odd experience, um, you know having no one to tune to, to you know, no one to give you an A. <laughs> and like, you know, just, okay, go. All right, I'll just play, I'll just play a bit. So that, that was a bit weird. Um, but actually, the, the, the acoustic in the, in the studio in Northumberland was so lovely. It's an old church, so it was just gorgeous to play it. And actually, I just ended up sort of reveling in the acoustic a bit. Yeah. But I, I am so self-critical in the recording process that Andy, Bell and I, we were, we were recording faster than we could critique. Um, so it would be like, I'd do a take, and it would be like, you know, yeah, that, that felt really good. Cool, yeah, I thought that was great. Move on, and do another one. And so we weren't listening back to everything by any stretch. Yeah. Because when I do that, I go, oh, no, no, awful, don't like it, don't like it, don't like it, put it in the bin. So we were, we were recording faster than, than I could <laughs> dismiss any of it. Yeah. So but did you then go back and then self critique or was that it then? Was that was that the take that was used? Uh, the, all the main fiddle takes were the ones from those first sort of bits except the Battle of the Somme uh, and the Valiant Soldier. Uh, all the other ones were just those those yeah that was good, let's keep that. Cool. Um, yeah. Then Becky Price came in and did the piano. Um, and then we went to Sheffield and we layered up the guitars and the string section and the horns uh, and then we went to Woodworm Studios in near Banbury which used to be Fairport Convention Studio uh, that was a really cool place to go and that's where Rob put his bits on Constantino Harmonium and Ben came to do his bits of bass and then I finished off all the other bits of, of fiddle so it was very much layered up, started with me and ended with me and everyone else went on in the middle. But we did the whole thing in six days, I think. Wow. Yeah. What's your favourite thing about the recording process? The recording process? Uh, I, I don't enjoy recording. Oh, really? Uh, no. I don't know many people that do enjoy recording, really. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a very strange thing to do uh, because you, I don't know, listening back to yourself and, you know, all musicians are horribly self-critical. Um, so it, it, it's not something I, I love doing. I think my favourite part of the recording process this time was actually hearing, once I'd done my bits and everyone else came in, sort of hearing it come together was, was fantastic. And there were some brilliant bits of, of sort of in the moment interaction, you know, the stuff with Jack Rutter, when he arrived, at the studio we hadn't played them together and we hadn't finalized any arrangements so it was literally here's the girl I left behind me what do you fancy doing uh, 
and you know within an hour we'd arranged it and done it and it was so exciting to be creating something that immediate and that in the moment mm. um, and putting I think my favorite bit really was on the Battle of the Somme which is kind of a big track on the record when all the strings were sort of being layered up and it just started to sound absolutely enormous and then Sam Fisher was putting down the flugelhorn and the cornet on it it was just amazing and there's this little motif at the end which no one's pointed out in any in anything I've read um, but there's a little tiny motif from the last post at the very very end um, and I just loved I loved that bit when that bit came in and we sort of all sat back and listened to the Battle of the Somme and it sort of finished form it was like wow this is this is amazing so when you come to tour this album mm. what's the makeup of the are you going on your own or no it's actually it's great the the band is really cool it's, it's me uh, Jack Rutter on guitar which is interesting because Jack's only on three tracks on the record mm -hmm. Um, uh, ben Nichols on bass, again, he's only on three tracks on the record, but he's in the whole thing. Rob Harbour and Patsy Reed. Uh, Patsy's not on the album, but I needed somebody else to cover all my other fiddle and viola parts. Yeah. Um, so it does sound really quite different to the album, because we're not touring a piano, and there's a lot of guitar and a lot of bass. So it's a kind of full sound, but it is quite, it is quite different. Yeah. If you come to one of the gigs, it, it won't sound like the album. Uh, but for me, that, you know, it's great, isn't it? When you go and see a band do a gig and it just sounds like the record, you could have, you could have maybe stayed at home and put, and put the record on. So it is different, which is cool, I think. 